There is no better way to know us than as two wolves come separately to a wood. Now neither is able to sleep, even at a distance distracted by the soft, competing pulse of the other, nor able to hunt at every step, looking backwards and sideways, wary to listen for the other's slavering rush. Neither can make die the painful burning of the coal in its heart till the other's body and the whole wood is its own. Then it might sob contentment toward the moon. Each in a thick, rage horse in its laboring chest after a skirmish Eyes brighter than is natural under the leaves, but a wren, peeping round a leaf, shrieks out to see a chink so terrifyingly open unto the red smelting of hatred, as each pictures the final satisfaction. Suddenly they duck and appear, and they ride by the great lord his embroidered cloak floats, the tail of his horse pours, and at his stirrup the two great-eyed greyhounds that day after day bring down the towering stag leap like one, making delighted sounds. This house has been far out at sea all night. The woods crashing through darkness, the booming hills, wind stampeding the fields under the window, floundering black astride and blinding wet till they rose. Then, under an orange sky, the hills had new places and wind wielded blade light luminous black and emerald, flexing like the lens of a mad eye. At noon I scaled along the house side, as far as the co-house door. Once I looked up. Through the front wind that dented the balls of my eyes, the tent of the hills drummed and strained its gyro, the fields quivering the skyline a grimace, at any second to bang and vanish with a flap. The wind flung the magpie away, and the black back gull bent like an iron bar slowly. The house rang like some fine green goblet in the note that any second would shatter it. Now deep in chairs in front of the great fire. We grip our hearts and cannot entertain book, thought, or each other. We watch the fire blazing and feel the roots of the house move that sit on, seeing the windows tremble to come in, hearing the stones cry out under the horizon. Stare at the monster. Remark 
how difficult it is to define just what amounts to monstrosity in that very ordinary appearance. Neither thin nor fat, hair between light and dark, and the general air of an apprentice, say, an apprentice house painter or amid an assembly of famous architects. The demeanor is of mouse, yet is he monster. First scrutinize those eyes for the spark, the effulgence, nothing. Nothing there but the haggard, stony exhaustion of a near-finished variety artist. He slumps in his chair like a badly hurt man, half life-size. Is it his dreg-boozed inner demon? still tankarding from tissue and follicle, the vital fire, the spirit electrical that puts the gloss on a normal hearty male? Or is it women? The truth, bring it on with black drapery, drums and funeral tread, like a great man's coffin. No, no, he is not dead. But in this truth, surely half buried. Once the humiliation of youth and obscurity, the autoclave of heady ambition trapped, the fermenting of a yeasty heart stopped, burst with such pyrotechnics the dull world gaped, and repeat that, still they cry. But all his efforts to concoct the old heroic bang from their money and praise, from the parent's pointing finger and the child's amaze, even from the burning of his wreathed bays, have left him wrecked, wrecked and monstrous. So, as a stegosaurus, a lumbering, obsolete arsenal of gigantic horn and plate, from a time when half the world still burned, 